Well, I mean, I, I was born in London, um, but uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mutt. Uh, my mother was born in Kenya. My father was born in Fiji. My ancestors are from India. Uh, and you know, I, I grew up in, uh, in London and spent basically most of my time in, the, in the, the basement of the convenience store that my parents ran. Growing up uh, in, in Britain, but as part of a, a sort of South Asian diaspora, was big in ways that I, I didn't expect. Um, and, and, and there was a sort of transformative moment for me uh, that I remember, I, I think I was about six years old. Uh, and my parents had taken me and my brother to, to India to, so that we would you know, know what it is to be Indian. And uh, we, we would uh, learn some Gujarati, which is the language that my, my, my parents uh, spoke at home. Uh, and we were at a stoplight in Bombay, I think, uh, and we were inside a taxi and it was raining. Uh, and all of a sudden, there was this knocking sound uh, at the window, sort of tap, tap, tap. Uh, and you know, outside of the window was a, a, a girl. I mean, I, I imagine she was an adolescent. Uh, and in, in her hands was a tiny baby. Uh, and the baby was crying and crying and crying. Uh, and there was screaming outside the car, and she was tapping on the window asking for money. And, and soon there was screaming inside the car because I, I, I was howling. I, I, I wanted it to stop. I, I, wanted, uh, I wanted my parents to, 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 to give her some money. And then as, as we sort of drove away from the lights, um, I kept on howling. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to know why why that was why was she out on the outside of the car and why were we, were, were, were we on the inside why does she you know she not have a home and we did um how, how comes we could afford to fly to india and she could, could you know she, she, she was begging at a street light now, now that kind of experience i mean I, I i'm not trying to make myself out as as anyone special I mean, everyone has that moment i mean one of the the, the most sort of you know, something you're guaranteed to hear in any playground uh, are howls of that's not fair I mean, we all have that. Um, but for me, that moment uh, never really left me. I, I still carry that little girl around with me. Um, and after, after that happened, I uh, went back to Britain and you know, I started sort of renting out my toys to, uh, to, to my friends. And you know, their parents would give them pocket money so that they could play whatever toy it is that I had. Uh, and I would give that money to, to, to charity, to, you know, to, to aid. Um, I mean, the, the, the thing in the news then was the, the, the famine in Ethiopia. So we set, sent the money off to Ethiopia. Uh, and I, I found myself to be a sort of junior capitalist turned philanthropist. Um, but, you know, there's, there's only so much toy rental that you can do before you realize that actually the problem is still there. Um, and being exposed to the, you know, actually the, the, the persistent problems in India uh, year after year um, made me realize that actually, you know, the, you know Short-term fixes like uh, sending overseas aid, while tremendously important, are not sufficient. Uh, and you need to get to the the, the, the deeper root causes of things. Um, and I, I studied in uh, in in Britain uh, and in the United States and uh, and in South Africa, both looking for those answers and also learning from uh, from people who purported in some cases uh, and who actually did in other cases have answers to how you know, how to address the deeper root causes of poverty. One of the things that, that uh, I learned from uh, groups around the world, uh, particularly um, looking at uh, issues of hunger, um, is that the, the, the root cause of hunger isn't that there's a shortage of food. There's, there's more than enough food on Earth today to feed everyone one and a half times over. Um, we've got plenty of food on this planet. But the reason people are going hungry is not because of a shortage of food, um, but because of poverty. Uh, so, one of the, the uh, I mean, people are not sitting sitting idly by, waiting for food to fall into their laps. Um, you know, the, 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 there's, I mean, the, the, there is that kind of vision, and particularly when, when we're thinking about how how to change the world. Uh, sometimes you'll hear this this line of. Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, but teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. And all of us can, can kind of get behind that and think, yeah, that's pretty cool. Teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. But, I mean, the trouble is, think about what sort of image that, that rests upon. I mean, it, it has at, at heart the idea that, you know, you've given a man a fish and so you, a couple of guys in, in the third world somewhere sitting next to a, a flowing river and they're chomping down on their fish. Um, and they're enjoying their fish very much, and you know, they'll look over into the river and say, well, well, well what's that? Oh, it looks like a fish. 
Well, how are we going to get it out? Oh, I have no idea. We will have to wait for the white man to come give us another fish. But of course, I mean, it's tremendously disempowering. That's a nuts vision of, of how things happen in, in developing countries. Actually, in developing countries, people have been fishing for a very, very long time. Um, what the, the aid complex uh, and, and what uh, you know, modern development uh, has done for, for developing countries is impose a vision of how fishing should happen. Uh, and that, vi that vision is very unsustainable. And it comes from outside. It comes from Europe. It comes from North America. Uh, a vision that, that markets and uh, free markets and uh, modern capitalism is going to make life much, much better. And in the process, the, the ways that people have been fishing, the ways that, that, that uh, social organization has been managed, often very sustainably, is destroyed and swept away. Now, one of the, uh, the ways that people have been fighting back is, is through organizing and developing their own principles, their, their, their own ways of, of democratically organizing and sharing resources. Um, and I, I was privileged enough to, to, to come across a number of farmers and farmers' organizations and landless people's organizations uh, that have been organizing around uh, the, the principle of, of how to feed themselves. Uh, and the, the vision that they have is a vision called food sovereignty. Now, food sovereignty is, uh, I mean, the, the definition is very long. And if you're interested, you know, go to Wikipedia and, and check out food sovereignty. And it's a great definition. Um, but in essence, the idea of food sovereignty uh, is that uh, people have the ability to be able to make their own decisions about food and agriculture policy. Now, th that may not sound like terribly much. I mean, the right to be able to make your own decisions about food policy uh, sounds pretty vapid. It, it sounds like, well, you know, it's, it's a right to have rights over your food system. It doesn't seem to contain any policy. But in fact, it does. Uh, I mean, it, it, the, 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 the full definition of food sovereignty demands that there are things like women's rights being respected and uh, uh, agrarian reform so that there's you know, a fair and equal land distribution. But, but uh, I mean, the, the, the actual deep idea in the idea of food sovereignty is that we need democracy in shaping our food system. We need a, a way of uh, actually everyone getting around the table and having a conversation about food and agriculture and the way that uh, people around the world get to eat and the way that, that people around the world get to develop and, uh, and, and realize their full potential. Now, that turns out to be pretty radical because, as I say, the, the history of food policy, the history of agricultural policy in poor countries uh, has been one where people from the outside will come in, teach people how to fish uh, and or, or teach people how to grow food or uh, essentially destroy the sustainable agriculture that, that, that exists in developing countries uh, and replacing it with uh, an, an agriculture that, that uh, at the moment is looking increasingly unsustainable. Uh, and so having food sovereignty, having a democratic conversation about food is actually pretty new. Um, most countries have never had a democratic conversation about food. We haven't in the United States, but pretty much no country has had a, 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 a democratic process where people decide, well, you know, how, how are we going to make sure that everyone at a national level gets to eat and that, that we distribute food fairly and that, that we have sustainable agricultural practices so that our kids will inherit a, a planet and an agriculture system that sustains them as much as it sustains us. Right now, I mean, we're on the brink of, of, of basically emptying the oceans. We're, we're on, uh, heading towards uh, a climate change catastrophe fueled uh, in, in no small part by unsustainable agriculture that will mean that you know, in, in a couple of generations' time, it, well, there'll be 9 billion people on Earth and a great deal more hungry people than we have right now. Food sovereignty is a way of democratically getting us back onto a track of sustainability.